Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending where you are. Welcome to, to today's public webinar presented by National Nanotechnology Initiative, the NNI. Thank you for joining us. I'm Hongda Chen, the National Program Leader for Bioprocessing and the Nanotechnology at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture of USDA. I'll be moderating the webinar today. The NNI public webinars are an important platform for NNI participating agency and the nanotechnology R&D community. It allows us to share information on advancement, resources, and priorities while also providing a platform to identify potential needs and challenges faced by the community. Today's panel will discuss how nanotechnology enabled sensors or nano sensors are promising tools to advance precision agriculture and support the food safety and a robust food supply chain. Please visit the NNI website at nano.gov for additional information. Today, our panel experts, Dr. Sam Nugent, Dr. Michael Strano, Dr. Vanji Alo Sierra, and Dr. Jonathan Clausen will share their vision for how the development and the deployment of nanosensors could transform agricultural and food system. They will highlight the state of the science, discuss community needs to push the science forward, and explore the challenges associated with bringing these technology to market. Let me start with a brief panel uh, introduction. Dr. Nugent is the Associate Professor of Food and Biosystem Engineering at Cornell University's Department of Food Science. His group combines synthetic biology, genetic engineering, and nanotechnology to develop methods to rapidly detect bacteria in food and water samples. Today, he will cover the engineering of bacterial phages as rapid diagnostic for their host bacteria. Dr. Strano is a Carbon P. Dubs Professor of Chemical Engineering at MIT. He leads the disruptive and sustainable technologies for agricultural precision, or DSTEP which is a part of an interdisciplinary research group in the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology Center. These step of research focus on novel sensors to study the production of plant hormones and secondary metabolites to improve urban farming. Dr. Alosia Ha is a professor in the Department of Biosystems and Agriculture Engineering at Michigan State University. She is the founding program director of the Nano Biosensor Lab, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Inventors, and a founder of the Global Alliance for Rapid Diagnostics, a consortium of scientists around the world committed to improving global health. Her research focuses on protecting consumers from falsified products through the blockchain nano bio-enabled anti-counterfeiting technologies. Dr. Clausen is currently an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Iowa State University and was through the translational health uh, Iowa State University Presidential High Impact High Initiative. Before joining Iowa State University, Professor Clausen worked as a postdoctoral researcher within the Center for Biomolecular Science and Engineering at the U.S. Naval Research Lab under the director of Dr. Igor Madins and uh, within the Department of Nano Engineering at the University of California, San Diego, under the director of Professor Joseph Wang. Professor Clausen received his Master uh, of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a PhD in Biological Engineering at the Purdue University. Professor Clausen's research interests focus on fabrication of nanomaterials and nanostructured devices for, for a wide variety of applications, including biosensors, energy harvesters, and a cellular interface material. Before I turn it over to Sam to kick off the webinar, 
I have a few housekeeping announcements. We have reserved time for Q&A at the conclusion of the presentations. So I would encourage you to please put your questions into Q&A box. And I will try to get to as many questions as possible. The next NLI public webinar will be next week, uh, June 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, titled What We Know About Nano EHS Human Health. More information on all of the NLI public webinars can be found on nano.gov, and you can also follow the NLI on Twitter at NLI Nano News. So with that, and I turn it over to Sam to kick this, uh, this afternoon's session. Sam, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Hongda, and to the webinar organizers. And this talk, I'm gonna go over some of our recent efforts to engineer bacteriophages, as you can see here, uh, to serve as biological nanoprobes designed to detect their host bacteria. So let me set the stage a little bit for the opportunities in food and agriculture where we can use nanotechnology. So here in the States, uh, food is often grown in resource limited areas. So that's to say that these aren't places that typically have a lab associated with them. Uh, so samples typically have to be sent out and to be tested on site requires a lot of uh, attention to detail and, and, and when we're designing the, uh, the sensors. So about 50% of our outbreaks are due to produce and the majority of those are, are leafy greens. And the FDA has recently recognized water as a major source of contamination. So if we look at this picture here, we're spraying water onto crops and uh, possibly contaminating those crops with that water if it's got uh, harmful bacteria in it. So this is something that we now have to test uh, to, to make sure that we're not contaminating. So what's with this rice? Uh, this is really to illustrate the difficulty of detecting bacteria in food and water. Uh, for both drinking water and food processed water, that's water that would be used to rinse food, there must be no detectable E. coli in 100 ml of water. So that's a fairly large sample. And no detectable E. coli means we cannot detect a single CFU in 100 ml. So this is here to illustrate that if I took one grain of rice and threw it in a swimming pool the size of 100 Olympic sized swimming pools, that's the, the goal that we have, is to detect something that small and not big of a sample. That's the same size ratio as one CFU of E. coli inside 100 mLs of water. So this is really our bottleneck. And if we look at how do we detect uh, bacteria in water, uh, this is really what we're looking for, generic E. coli. So this gives us an idea that there has been fecal contamination. Uh, ideally, since you're a nanotechnology crowd, we have some kind of nanobot that could float around in here and be able to detect our E. coli. If we Google nanobots, we see all sorts of images uh, which have come up in the past. This is, of course, science fiction. Uh, but ideally, we could have this nanobot swim around and not only recognize, but bind to our bacterium and let us know that it, that it was there. So give us some kind of indication, hey, this water is of course tainted and maybe even ideally kill the bacteria. So it turns out that nature has done this for us. So if we look at nature for inspiration, we have something called a bacteriophage. Uh, and you can see this is a bacterial surface. A bacteriophage is a virus that specifically infects bacteria. So it's harmless to humans, but it binds onto bacteria using these tail fibers here. It recognizes it, uh, and afterwards, it will inject its DNA into that, similarly to how viruses attack us. Once it injects its genome, of course, you can see the genome is located here in its capsid, it is able to replicate inside its host. So this genome, which we can engineer and add different genes to it, is then introduced into the thing that we are trying to detect. It then replicates, and then after part of the natural life cycle, it makes enzymes which then burst the host, releasing all of the contents into our sample. So this is very helpful if we think of this as a starting point for a detection system. Because we have a biorecognition element, we have something that's easily replicated and something that delivers genes all in one evolved biological unit. If we were to add an enzyme inside there so that we could detect if that infection took place. We have a lot of options. We could go with bioluminescent like luciferase. 
We can go with color metric or electrochemical like alkaline phosphatase. We can simply add the genes for those enzymes into the genome of the bacteriophage. That way, when the infection takes place, we will know that it happened because we can detect that enzyme. This translates into a sensor where bacteriophages that are engineered can infect the, the host bacteria. Of course, they're going to replicate inside them, produce this enzyme here that we can now detect. And then we have a bunch of ways which we can then detect that enzyme. This could be, again, electrochemical, luciferase, or even colorimetric. We took a little bit of a spin on making our reporter enzyme. So here we use, we put this gene, the luciferase gene, into this phage. Uh, and then we added a tag to it. So this luciferase gene uh, makes a luciferase and then it binds onto cellulose. So this is a carbohydrate binding module that binds onto cellulose. We did the same with alkaline phosphatase, where we have an alkaline phosphatase gene, we added a tag to it. This is a dimer, so we get two tags on this one. Uh, and these and reporter enzymes now can bind cellulose. This is helpful because if we uh, if we can use these to then concentrate the reporter, we can get a lower detection limit. To show that they're actually binding, we can spot them onto cellulose pads, and we can see if they didn't have a cellulose binding module, like these don't, we get signal bleed, and the enzyme diffuses, leaves the pad, whereas we get nice tight signals with anything with the CBM on it. This has resulted in taking the current standard of water testing, where we put a water sample in here and filter it through. We take this filter from here, uh, which now contains all the bacteria that have been filtered out of a drinking water sample. We add the phage to it. And then if we add our substrate, everywhere there was bacteria on this pad are then marked because those enzymes are there. So now we can just count how many uh, CFUs we had. On there. Of course, these would then be dead because of the infection, but the enzyme that came out of every E. coli were then immobilized directly in vicinity of the E. coli. If we had uh, a system where we had, say, irrigation water that needed to be detected, uh, that, that may be a little bit of a problem because filtration, of course, would foul. So we have to look at what if we could just magnetize the phages, something like this, where the phages can bind onto the E. coli and of course, they're now magnetized. So if we take a magnet, put it by this water sample, we could essentially pull the E. coli out of the water sample, leaving all the, the particulates behind. We could then aspirate the sample. And what we end up with is, of course, just a concentrated sample containing our E. coli. How do we get? bacteriophages onto magnetic particles. Uh, so traditionally people have tried using a, a primary amine. So just using say EDC, NHS type chemistry where we would just bind down to a surface that's got a carboxylic acid. This is a little bit of a problem. Even the phages are made out of proteins on their capsules, the whole phage is made out of proteins. So we would want particles to bind here, but since the whole phage is made out of proteins, including the tail fibers, which recognize the bacteria, uh, they would bind there too. And this would result in a phage that can no longer infect bacteria. We've looked at biotin modified capsids. So if we put a specific tag on, we can an enzymatic conversion to put biotin on there. And as many of you may know, biotin and streptavidin can bind fairly strongly together. The issue here is purify streptavidin to be used in an assay where we have meters squared of nanoparticles gets pretty expensive. And that's why we decide on click chemistry. The goal, of course, is to have our phage put into the particles and the solution with the particles and then be able to rapidly uh, bind on. As we can see here. Here's some particles, larger particles that have bound onto these red E. coli. Here's nanoparticles that have bound onto this E. coli. I'll give you a quick run through of how we did this. Um, we essentially bound onto these proteins here, uh, the, these purple proteins, which are called the SOC protein. There's 870 copies of them. These are the ones we modified with an unnatural amino acid, having the unnatural amino acid with an alkene 
group on it allows us now to bind onto an uh, azide containing nanoparticle. Here is that, uh, unnat or the, the, the SOC protein. So essentially, we took the unnatural amino acid, which is here. We engineered it onto that SOC protein along with a his tag for purification reasons, and then incorporated it into the uh, phage. If we look at how well this can detect, if we took just E. coli and we separated E. coli from water, we get a fairly strong signal. If we added all this background E. coli or background bacteria, we still get a fairly strong signal. The background alone gives not very much signal and same with the, uh, the buffer. Compare the overall detection ability of magnetic phages to detecting E. coli in water. Here we have 100 CFU per ml. Uh, I'm sorry, here's an E. coli and CFU per ml. And we can see the luminescence signal here versus plating. Uh, and we get a fairly strong signal with the limit of detection defined somewhere around seven uh, CFU uh, per 100 ml. Bottom line is uh, sample prep is the key. And so if nanotechnology can help with sample prep, that would be fantastic because the problem is not detecting uh, E. coli in purified samples, it's detecting it in dirty and large samples. Phages are good for separation because they have evolved to do exactly that, to bind onto bacteria and uh, custom reporter probes is what we need for better detection. I'd like to thank the funding agencies and also turn it over to Professor Michael Strano from MIT. Thank you. You're muted. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for, for that. Yes. Um, Sam reminds me that I really have to up, up my game when it comes to scientific present, presentation. These animations were uh, were fa fantastic. Um, so I, I have decided to use my very limited time um, in, instead of talking about global implications, which we can hash out in the panel se session and, and questions, um, to just get right to the, to the science. So I'm going to com communicate um, science from my, my perspective in the field. I, I come to the field from, from a nanotechnology uh, per, per perspective, and my interest in plants um, came from a series of ob observations. So my, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about um, what, what I see as big advances in the past few years um, in our understanding of how to apply nanotechnology to, to plant sy systems. And it follows from, from Sam's presentation quite well. So I'll get right into it. Um, we started a couple of years ago noticing that some nanoparticles actually don't have to be attached to, to a viral capsid as, um, as uh, the previous speaker showed, but will just spontaneously go through several important um, lipid bilayer membranes, including what you're seeing here is actually, it just so happens, uh, carbon nanotubes wrapped in DNA. Michael, we're not seeing your slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, are you sure about that? Let's see. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you for thank you for showing that. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, what you're seeing, 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 seeing here is actually negatively charged uh, car carbon nanotubes. Um, that are uh, that are flowing past and inserting them, them, themselves into extracted chlor chloroplasts. So these are um, chlor chloroplasts have a, a double lipid bilayer membrane, and on these particles which fluoresce in the near infrared, you're seeing them make the chloroplast glow. And um, certain nanoparticles will do this spontaneously. They, they, so they don't have to be attached to a viral uh, ca capsid. They have as a part of their chemistry. Whoops, sorry, sorry about that. And I've got another video here. This happens. This is a nanoparticle, and and you see that uh, it inserts into the into the chlor chlor chloroplast, and then it bounces around, and it shows the characteristic um, signature of confined confined diffusion. Now, basically, some nanoparticles will do this, and, and some some will not. And my, my attraction to the to the plant field, and uh, in per particular, was trying to understand this. Why do some nanoparticles do it, and and and, and some don't? The implications for plant science and agriculture are, are pretty significant. Uh, you can actually 
you can actually get this be behavior to 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 to, to happen uh, for nanoparticles that you just inject right into the say say the leaf la lamina here. Now, this is a, a, a nanoparticle solution uh, applied to to the underside of a ribidopsis, and you can see that you you fill the fluid into the mesophyll, and then if your particles have the right properties, they can actually go. You're supposed to see see here that this is um, you see. Uh, carbon nanotubes, and then the green is the chloroplast uh, autofluorescence. And you can see even from outside the plant, you can park par particles directly into the plant cell and even into the chloroplast. And so this, this ability to traverse these series of membranes and biological barriers is, is unprecedented to, um, up, up to this point. And we're very interested in, in how this can happen. Uh, I have a lot of data, I'm gonna condense it for, for you, but basically, Nanoparticles that are strongly um, negatively charged or positively charged can actually show show this. So th these are uh, these happen to be carbon nanotubes wrapped in DNA. They have a negative zeta potential, and they will and they will traverse um, these lipid bilayer membranes and go right into the chlor chloroplast. Um, but but chitosan wrapped carbon nanotubes are positively charged, uh, and we'll do the same thing. So they'll they'll show up. You're, you're supposed to see here the chloroplast, and you see you see um, you see the f fluorescence here. Interestingly enough, if you're negatively charged but you're too small, or actually if you wrap the nanotube in the same lipids that comprise some of these bilayer membranes or single layer, uh, you you do not get tra tra transport. And this is actually an important clue. So this led us to a very powerful theory which uh, so far describes virtually every nanoparticle system that we've studied in, in the literature. And there's a lot of mathematics that go to this. I'm just gonna condense it for, for the audience here. Basically, uh, what happens is if a particle is negatively charged or positively charged, um, it, will ha it will necessarily have an ionic cloud ar around it. When that ionic cloud impinges upon either a, a single or a double layer membrane, uh, it, it, will, it will soften it. And the physics of this are very well, well known. Um, what, we, what we understand to be happening is that there's a lipid exchange. So the, the, the lipid will then um, bind with un, unsaturated sites on what's called the nanoparticle corona. And um, this pulls the, nano, the particle in, but what, what emerges on the other side is a kinetically trapped nanoparticle. So it no longer uh, has the driving force um, to, to pass back through. That makes the process irrever irreversible. Uh, you have to take my word for it. If you put equations to all those steps, you work it out, you come up with this theory, uh, which, which so far describes a broad range of plants and almost any nanoparticle. Um, we're still looking for exceptions to, to it. Uh, the zeta potential uh, versus the size of the, the, par the particle, the equation, which I'll show, but I don't want to over overwhelm, um, has positive and negative solutions. So it basically predicts that if a particle has sufficient charge for its size, it can traverse um, any biological membrane using this particular mechanism, which, which we call LEAP, um, lipid exchange envelope penet pen penetration. And it's broadly applicable. This is These are data points for nanoseria. The, these are even points that others have collected in the literature. Um, so here's our chitosan wrapped carbon nanotubes. Here's streptavid and quantum dots. Do not go into the chlor. chlor chloroplast. And the equation, I'll leave it for, for you to, to go through it, but it's completely predictive. So if I, I can look up parameters about membrane f f physics and I, can, and I, and I can, can apply it. It applies even for extracted protoplast. So it can describe um, whether a particle will go into the plant cell uh, or go into the chloroplast or remain there or just stay in the vasculature. So it's a very powerful um, theory. It basically says we can make a nanoparticle and control where it goes into key compartments in the plant. Um, so it enables a lot of new things. Uh, we have a lot of applications we've been hacking into the plant. This is one for this particular auto audience. Uh, we got we, we got feedback from different um, audiences saying, well, can you deliver a gene cassette like what we just saw? Uh, and it turns out that that you can. This is a carbon nanotube wrapped in chitosan, and we've complexed it with, with a plasmid DNA. And you, you can see here, if you apply LEAP, you can adjust the charge by changing the pDNA to chitosan ratio. And LEAP Leap is leap is spot on, meaning that when it's a when the charge brings the complex down to this one one to one, we see no no um, we we see no yellow fluorescent protein in the um, in the chloroplast. Uh, but if you increase the charge, 
we you you see, you see the expression and it follows exactly the 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 the, the theory the deterministic nature of this equation uh continues to be amazing to me so it's and this set us off doing oh also it's species agnostic and i think that's one point that we wanted to to, to, to make this this um these mechanisms appear to appear to be immediately usable we in uh, arugula watercress spinach tobacco we've done oil palm we've done um fuji apple trees we've done so it's it's um it's a it's a tool that's unique in that it's immediately applicable to a broad range of of uh, uh, of uh, crops here We've been doing a combination of, of 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 things. We've been hacking into the plant uh, to to do things like turn them into sensors. I just showed this video because it shows you some of the some of the things that you can do. So these are there are nanoparticles in this uh, spinach sapling, and I'm putting actually a dilute solution of picric acid in in, in the roots. The plant will transpire this, and uh, we show that from a long distance away. You can actually um, you you can use the infrared signature from implanted nano particle sensors, just a cell phone type of camera, and you can de detect explosives transpired up into the plant. Um, and and um, and that this this can this then you can you use use the plant as a sensor. And there's a whole range of applications that we're working all on, on at MIT. But, but the ones I want to talk about today are where we took take the sensors and turn them in inside and intercept plant signaling. We think we've made a big break breakthrough here. So this is actually a, um, these are some nanoparticle sensors for hydrogen per peroxide. We have a whole range of, of these now for, for plant hormones and for, and for arsenic. Um, we're extending the, these tools to almost anything you'd like to measure inside the plant. So please uh, co contact us. This is basically, uh, you're seeing spatial and temporal signaling um, of the transient hydrogen peroxide wave that occurs just what just so happens when you wound a plant. So this is in the living plant. If you wound it, th these are experiments that are well, well studied. And uh, it turns out that you get a very characteristic wave. Uh, this, this wave we've been mathematically describing, it's very unique to wounding in, in the plant. It turns out it has an, an analytical mathematical solution. You can measure it in different plants. It's uh, amplitude, full width at half max, and the speed of the wave, also called the lag, uh, seems to vary for different crops. So for uh, spinach and strawberry bile, again, we can compare all of these crops. But this wave form seems to be um, evolutionarily can, can, can can conserve this asymmetric form with, with a sharp increase and, and, and a tail. And we believe we understand why that is. We, we actually have a mathematical expression. But uh, new things are, are enabled here. Like this is um, the, the first bite of a pest to a plant actually can be transduced. If you intercept this signal, you can actually see every single wounding that, that's associated with the insect. And so uh, we, we can now see in real time what's happening in the plant um, in a way that we, that, uh, that we weren't able to do so before. A lot of new science here. I wanna end with this. This is the end of my, the end of my talk. Um, is that if you then look at different kinds of stressors and you look at the resulting wave intercepted in, in, in this way, you've got, you have a characteristic you know, wave form for mechanical wounding, like I just show, sh showed you, Seem, seems to apply across uh, species. But if you subject the, the plant to heat stress, this is wi wi widely studied in the field, you get a, you get a very different waveform. It's completely different waveform. Uh, mathematically, it's it's different. It's, it's a different wave. Um, if you do uh, light, you can also show that 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 is also uh, light stress is also a different waveform. If you do the this um, this pathogen test, this uh, um, FLG22, it's widely used. Uh, you get a completely different you know uh, characteristic shape of the wave waveform. It changes from species to species just just the amplitude and the full width at half max. But these these sort of wave forms are unique, and we're underway now. We we we're working with the USDA. I'm very I'm very pleased. Um, to, to say that we're we're trying to decode and, and understand these these waveforms to to give value to the farmer. This is my my last slide on the vision. Um, I'm I'm working as part of a center with MIT uh, colleagues where we have some broader ag agricultural ideas. We're trying to use tools like these na nano sensors um, to bridge the divide b b between what we observe in laboratory plants. Um, and the fundamental gap in taking that really uh, fa fantastic science and applying it to the field. So we're hoping these species agnostic tools uh, can connect model plant work and what we can do in plants with mutants um, and connect those to the field in a, in a, in a broader way. And so uh, with that, and of course, we're gonna need machine learning and quantitative tools. It's not just a matter of, of plugging a small sensor in. 
Um, so with, with, with that, I would like to thank the, 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 the audience and my group. And um, I'll, I'll, I will now turn the presentation over to the next speaker, who, uh, which, and I forget which one is the next speaker. Sorry about that. I'm the next speaker. Oh, <laughs> I'm Angela um, Alessia, and you told us how to pronounce your, your name. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If you could, uh, I'll share my screen. If you could uh, close this screen. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Now I can basically uh, proceed to my my uh, slideshow because everything that the previous speakers have provided a wonderful introduction for my next uh, talk. So my slides would argue that the nano nanotechnology is an excellent enabling technology for sustaining our food supply. So this is the summary of my talk. And so after this, uh, let me just see this one. So you can see that the end goal is sustainable and safe food. In my case, we're developing rapid diagnostics, nanotechnology enabled diagnostics. And what is the current state of science? I argue that there are, there's plenty of work on research and development, nanotechnology based. And they are excellent, just like the two speakers before me, they're excellent, they can show that it works. My problem there is that they are necessarily, not necessarily designed for easy access to farmers, especially in resource limited settings. So what we need is accessible technologies, accessible diagnostics, therapeutics, whatever that is from the nanotechnology enabled, enabled systems to be simple, affordable, reliable, closed systems, point of care. Because agriculture is cost sensitive. We need to make sure that they are that kind of costing match with the needs of the industry. So what's the bottleneck? From my perspective, I think the bottleneck is from the systems, lack of systems framework. So we need to take advantage of the feedback of the natural biological system and also the technology provide feedback, in, uh, encourage closed loop and control. And how does the community support with that is to develop standard metrics so that these frameworks can move forward with our clear guidelines. And of course, beyond agriculture, we can use our diagnostics to have our water systems, biosurveillance, bio and even energy. So let me proceed with the next slide. I have, uh, let me see. So the current state of science is that they are there. There is no question about the availability of, of nanotechnology enabled diagnostics but at the moment they are expensive and they are time consuming. So we have, I think we know those, those systems. The summary is that they are not necessarily accessible. They are available, but not necessarily accessible. So we have to design for access. And I put the systems view of food wound disease uh, infection, just a little bit of systems perspective here. Whenever that this, there is a disease outbreak, we have the pathogens, we have the susceptible hosts, and we have ineffective control system. And if I match, map that into diagnostics, we have the pathogens, susceptible host, and ineffective diagnostic. And this is where the systems view or systems framework would come to play. Most of our detection technologies are in the detection side. We need to develop something that is on the screening side, as well as an assessment side. So from a systems perspective, we need to develop nano-enabled technologies that will allow us for rapid screening, then move into diagnostics, which is specific, and then back to assessment to make sure that our, our control strategies are effective. So here's a proposed systems framework for feed, with feedback loop for farm to fork food safety and security. We need, again, a screening method, which is what I call stage one technologies that are low cost, maybe cents per test, 10 cents, five cents, which can be finished in probably 10 to 20 minutes, which is simple that can be used on site by farm producers. 
food producers, and also in the supply chain. And then once we do that, we get into stage two, which is a little bit expensive, $2 per test, a little bit longer, but still within an hour, but still simple and on-site. And then once we have de developed the diagnosis, we then ne need to assess, does, does the uh, infection control effective? Is it effective? Or is it getting worse? So we go into stage three, which is again, low cost. In sense, less than a dollar, simple and on-site. For our technologies, we are using magnetic nanoparticles and gold nanoparticles as our enabling technologies. As we know, these nanomaterials have took advantage of those properties. We develop at what we call a cell phone enabled smart biosensor. We call that screening, multi-array recognition biosensing technology. And we're using cell phone, the imaging, image processing of cell phone as our enabling technology. So we integrate all this with the output of having to understand infection rate, temporal dynamics of pathogen infection, and decision support for infection management. The key is to understand the temporal dynamics of disease infection as a function of control strategies with the outcome of rapid and just-in-time decision-making process. And all can be done with using the cell phone as your enabling technology. This is quite a busy slide. We have a workflow of the smart biosensor, but the idea is the stage one is to re, uh, extract the bacteria using magnetic nanoparticles. And once we do that, we have discovered in the lab that a high level of, magnet, of bacterial pathogens in your sample would create what we call a mapping process. The, the left is a map of high level of bacteria in the sample, and the right is a map of no or healthy situation condition in the, in the field. We can take then a, 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 a cell phone image, process that into a, a black pixel count. And then once you do that, we can move to uh, stage two, which you can then extract a sample from the mapping, extract cell lysis, and we go into a DNA-based biosensor using our gold nanoparticles. The, the gold nanoparticles uses uh, an aggregation. And so if it is positive, if, if the target is positive, it, is, it remains red. If the target is absent, it turns to blue. Again, we can use the um, cell phone to get the picture and we can get a quantitative results. So we are using this to apply for food safety and antimicrobial resistance. This is just an overview of what, what the problem is in terms of uh, antimicrobial resistance in the US as well as globally. But the idea, the summary is it is not a good scenario. So here's our systems framework in a farm setting. You can then do a screening using again the mapping pattern. Then you go into a detection of pathogens. And once you have that uh, as, uh, identified what specific path pathogen, you can implement your systems control, system strategies, and then you can assess whether your strategy is working. So the next slides will be, I will uh, run through the slides, but just to illustrate that the results work. So this is a, 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 a PM image of the bacteria with the magnetic nanoparticles attached to it. And once you have that, it forms a, a matting pattern. This is again, a, a wastewater. The previous one is a drainage water from the farm. And this is the principle behind it. And once you have the magnetic nanoparticle with the bacteria, it provides a, a map. If there is no bacteria, it doesn't show any mapping. You can then look at the mapping pattern, go take a black pixel count. And this part here is the highest of the mapping and you can see a high black pixel count. This is a, a concentration dependence on the black pixel count. And we can see that the ma ma number uh, is uh, quantitative. You have then a concentration a relation between bacterial concentration and normalized pixel count. 
This is where the DNA-based biosensor, where you have a color change, and then you can get convert that into a, a gray scale. And the color on the, the below slide, uh, this is the control, and you can see the different uh, uh, shade of the color. In the matting, then you go into assessment with the matting pattern. You can see that zero is without treatment and 10 is with after treatment, and you can see a decrease in the matting pattern. We have applied this in many uh, bacteria in E. coli 015787, Salmonella, Staphylococcus aureus in food, Listeria and Bacillus cereus, Rastonia solanosarium, and other plant pathogens. African swine fever for the swine industry, tuberculosis, dengue, and Japanese encephalitis in clinical samples. And we are now using this for COVID-19 detection in several countries. So I have a plug here. We are organizing a, an innovation forum, bridging technologies and market needs on June 25th and 26th. You, it is free and please register to attend these sessions. Thank you so much for your time. I would like to acknowledge my, our funding sources and my lab and collaborators as well. That ends my presentation. And I would like to give the chair to Dr. Clausen. All righty, thanks so much, Fanji. Um, and, and thanks everyone uh, for your wonderful talks. I'm going to talk so, about. Um, so, do we go through the. Oh, yep. So I'm going to go ahead and Jonathan, finish yep. uh, piece of presentation and then we'll open up for QA. So, Jonathan, please proceed. Okay, sounds great. So, I'm going to talk today about scalable fabrication of electrochemical graphene sensors for precision agricultural applications. Um, and, and I think my talk kind of fits in nicely with, with the previous talks. Um, you know, just the big picture view of, of what we're talking about today and the problem is that we have a huge growing population, 9.7 billion people by 2050. That, need, that means that we need a 70% increase in worldwide food production and really new adaption of new land, land management strategies to, to meet those needs. And agricultural inputs that we use, fertilizers, pesticides, and, and irrigation, those account for about 20 to 40% of crop yield increases. So we're gonna continue to need to use those inputs. However, those inputs can cause problems. Uh, we know that they can cause biological dead zones in water and soil, for example. Fertilizer runoff can create algal blooms. Um, it can be surface groundwater depletion as we use more, more irrigation. And climate change is, is not helping. It's, it's exasperating these problems and there's been droughts and floods and, and leading to soil salinization and so forth. Um, so, the, and, and so we need um, new technology to kind of tackle um, um, these issues. Um, and, and we do have some of this equipment to already precisely deliver these agriculture inputs. So we have companies that can deliver fertilizers, not just a one-time input in the early spring, which is often done, but throughout the growing season at the base of a corn stalk, for example. Um, we do have some new technology to, to, to deliver pesticides only where needed in the field, such as using drone technology. But what we really need is, is still the sensors. And we heard some great talks by, by Sam, by Michael and Banji about pathogen detection, um, you know, using, uh, looking at plant stress, and, and kind of thinking of a system view of doing pathogen detection that Fauci just got over. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more, how can we use these sensors, incorporate them you know, into this, this, this big network and, and really understand what's going on in the farm field so that we can maybe map out uh, the inputs in the field, map out a pathogen uh, scenario in the field so that we can um, address that, uh, use less inputs or or potentially uh, get rid of that pathogen before it destroys the, the whole, whole crops. So the current state of the art in terms of monitoring some of these agricultural inputs is generally you need to pack up uh, a sample of soil and send it off to a laboratory. And that's, that's really time consuming and expensive. It can be up to $100 a sample just to look at heavy metals, for example, in water. And that it requires trained personnel 
gas liquid chromatography with mass spectroscopy or, or doing an ELISA array. That's conventionally how, how these pathogens and pesticides ha have been monitored um, or, or fertilizer ions. Um, some some um, commercialization has been has been done in fertilizer sensing. Uh, some field side detections and even putting a probe into the soil, they often aren't very robust and they haven't haven't lasted very long and they haven't really caught on um, into the precision agricultural space. And in terms of pesticide sensing, a lot of them are, are pretty limited, just to colorimetric sensors, which can be difficult to read the difference between a low and high signal uh, in the field. And they, they don't give you a quantitative analysis, such as, and they just give you a yes, no response. <clears throat> so what is really needed to push sensors for precision agriculture um, is both kind of single use and continuous sensors. So we need sensors that can detect pesticides um, and, and detect pathogens uh, in, in the field and, and on, on our, and our, our produce and so forth um, to, to ensure that we do have safe quality um, um, food that we can consume. But we also need continuous sensors that can be embedded into the farm field so we can measure fertilizers and fertilizer levels as they change with heavy rain events. Um, or change with the different composition of soils. So, so they could be integrated into the, um, that data could be put into the cloud and, and, and help control tractors, for example, when they're spraying. So they spray only when and where needed. And that could likewise be done with pesticides. So all of these types of sensors need to be produced to really push forward uh, this idea of precision agriculture. Um, and, and our sensors in our labs, we, we use the, the 2D nanomaterial called graphene to make them more sensitive um, and more robust. And, and graphene is well known to have incredible strength, incredible electrical conductivity um, that make them well suited for this type of sensing. Um, part of the issue though with using some of these nanomaterials is that they're so darn expensive. Uh, to make graphene, uh, conventional techniques include chemical vapor deposition in a tube furnace, which is a high temperature vacuum process. Um, and you get a small amount of graphene, uh, small yield process. Um, it has incredible material properties, um, but it's just too expensive for a lot of different um, agricultural technologies. Imagine if you want to measure pathogens on, you know, on heads of lettuce, they need to cost pennies because, you know, your, your costs need to be so low compared to the cost of the food that some of the consumers are buying. So what we've moved towards is making high yield graphene, just exfoliating uh, flakes of graphene from graphite and then putting them into a solution form and printing them. And we can print them through a wide variety of techniques. We don't maintain this, the incredible electrical conductivity and other material properties of graphene, but it's, it's good enough for sensors and it's a carbon-based material, so it's biologically friendly. Um, we can bind biologicals to them quite easily. Um, and we'll show you that we can change that surface structure so that it's more electrocatalytic for electrochemical sensing and more surface area to bind biorecognition agents to it. <clears throat> so here's some of the um, printing technologies that we use for graphene. We started out kind of just spin coating it here in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, we'd inkjet a polymer underneath and we could pattern with fairly high resolution on that surface. We've also gone to aerosol and inkjet printing and those are more rapid prototyping techniques where you can make a sensor and try it out and see how well it's working. And then screen and gravure printing is what we're moving to to kind of get it out the door towards commercialization. This is where you can make hundreds of, of, of sensors in one batch and that's where you can start getting down to, to the cost of pennies per sensor. Um, we also have worked with laser scribing, where we also convert poly image directly in, into graphene by using a laser that's rasping across it. So that might also be a low cost method because you don't have to make a solution phase ink with it. You can just create the graphene directly from, from a polymer. So after we make those graph, that graphene surface, it's not well suited for uh, sensors or electronics. It needs to be annealed in order to take out the binders in it, the non-conductive binders and solvents to make it electrically conductive. But we found a way that we can anneal it, not just only in a, in a furnace, but with a laser. And that laser 
converts it to make it electrically conductive, but we also can tune that properties of that laser that hits that graphene to make these really interesting nano and microstructures on the surface. And that's what you kind of see here in these scanning electron micrograph images, where you see this, these pyramid type structures or these kind of fins coming off of that surface in the micro and, and nano scale. And that allows us to, if we do it right, if we pattern it correctly, we can change the surface wettability from one that's hydrophilic to one that's super hydrophobic. And that hydrophobicity could be important for ion selective sensors. As you put that ion selective membrane over it, we don't want a water layer to build up underneath or, or, or we don't want it to foul underneath. And this, this improves the, the sensor um, stability and prevents drift. <clears throat> we also have more surface area for biorecognition agent loading and improves the sensor sensitivity by, by four or five fold at times. All of this we can do on polymers and paper even because this is a rapid pulse technique, technique that won't burn up paper. Um, so we can do it on flexible surfaces um, and we'll sh I'll show you a little bit that we can convert that into a wearable sensor as well. All of these graphene electrode surfaces though, um, we're working on a wide variety of projects to, for example, detect pesticides in the field and map out pesticides and link them to insecticide resistance. And we're using mosquito as a model. Uh, we're using some of these graphene sensors to look at pathogen detection, like other researchers today have talked about in, in this particular is salmonella detection. We're also working with researchers to make graphene from bio-derived um, grasses or bio-derived graphene inks. So we can, we can print them and then make them into sensors that can, can monitor fertilizers and heavy metals and, and hydroponics and, and do that monitoring. We've also worked with NSF to, to look at fertilizer ion detections with, with these type of graphene sensors. <clears throat> and some of the, I'll just briefly go over some of the research project results from this, but we, you know, we're able to detect <clears throat> a wide variety of, of pesticides with, with high selectivity. Here's a case of looking at neonicotinoids, neonicotinoids, which you know, have, have been causing a lot of different um, like honey ball, honeybee colony to collapse or, or, or issues with environmental impacts. Um, we can even kind of structure the, the graphene surface to make these pockets or, or um, more craters or even more surface area to improve our, our biosensor sensitivity. And these are just salt, salt origins that were added and then taken out in the annealing process to give us that, those, the surface roughness. We can then um, add enzymes to them to, to do organophosphate sensing. And because we have such unique um, high, high surface area um, graphene, we're able to get detection limits down to, you know, less than a nanomolar, which is lower than the EPA drinking water limit in water. So not, not only could we, we monitor some of these pesticides in surface waters, but even go back to the drinking water. That's how low we can get. And it's, it's label free, no pre-concentration. The response time is in seconds. Same with salmonella using a similar type of sensor, but with an antibody, we can get detection limit about 10 CFU per mil. We want to achieve, you know, ideally that one CFU per mil that Sam was talking about before. But again, this is label-free, no, no pre-concentration. And pre-concentration usually means incubating that bacteria for 24 to 48 hours. So this is, you know, really fast within 20 minutes. We've also developed with NSF a lot of different fertilizer ion sensing, you know, looking at them in soil columns and comparing them to conventional liquid junction electrodes that you could buy for 300, 300 to $500. And, and we get fairly similar results to those commercial sensors. Um, ours also just seems to last longer. It's more robust. We don't have to fill in an electrolyte solution behind an ion selective membrane, but we put the ion selective membrane right onto that surface of that graphene. So we don't need to regenerate it. And that way we can have it last for up to two months. Here's 72 days continuous sensing. And that means this could be something that could be put into the field and potentially used for continuous monitoring. We've also looked at some heavy metals as well. <clears throat> um, so other applications that we could do with this, open microfluidics, um, because we can tune the surface wettability of the graphene from hydrophobic to hydrophilic, 
um, we can actually move fluid across the surface because there's hydrophobic sidewalls and hydrophilic track. By Laplace pressure, water will flow through these tracks, through these wedge patterns. We can split samples uh, to, to do multiplex sensing and it can, it's strong enough to even move uphill. <clears throat> and then because we have this flexibility or this nature, this ability to print on paper or flexible polymers, we can also do wearable biosensing, something that could fit on, on the skin, for example. And we've combined them with a uh, microfluidic layer so we can shuttle that uh, or channel that sweat to the sensor and, and monitor things like glucose, lactate, or, or electrolytes in the skin to look at hydration and fatigue levels. So I just like to you know, thank all the students who are the people who really work on, on, on this research and all our collaborators for, for these grants that I talked about from Iowa State to the Naval Research Lab to all these different types of universities that really have helped make um, um, this, these projects viable. And of course, funding support from Hongdis program at USDA and the National Science Foundation as well as, as, long, as, well as these other sponsors. So thank you so much. And I think we're gonna turn it over to Q&A for all the panelists. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, uh, all of the panelists uh, for your excellent presentations. Uh, and uh, from your presentations, we learned that uh, the, the bigger pictures uh, as where your nanotechnology uh, development uh, may be applied. We've seen clearly a state of science uh, uh, that are demonstrated in each of your lab. And some of you uh, articulated the pathway leading forward to what is technology. So um, we still have a number of other questions we can ask, but at this point, uh, uh, maybe we should open to the audience first uh, and then in, invite us some questions. I look at uh, in the Q&A uh, section and there are two questions uh, addressed to two of the panelists which have been um, addressed individually. But those questions are made of uh, some common commonalities. Uh, I would invite all of the panelists to uh, make a comment if you wish. The first one is related to the sensors sensitivity. Uh, what's the limit of detection? So uh, this particular question was addressed to Sam. Sam provided answer online. And uh, I don't know if you wish to say a little bit more or others uh, feel free, other panelists feel, feel free to comment from your perspective, your technology perspective as well. Sure, so this really depends on the application. In many cases, if we're looking for indicator organisms, it could be that we are allowed 100 CFU per 100 ml. Uh, and if we're looking for pathogens, it's very often zero. So, and the sample size could vary. If we're looking at meat, it may be 25 grams that you have to test, or it could be 100 ml of water, uh, but it really depends. But the sensitivity is still always gonna be fairly uh, stringent. So. In, in water, in process water, one CFU per 100 ml is difficult, and that's something we've been trying to tackle uh, because it, it really just requires you to uh, find a way to concentrate your sample. Uh, the other thing people do is to just pre-enrich it, let it grow up so that one CFU becomes 100 CFU if you add media and just heat it up over time, and of course, it'll replicate. Yeah. So let me, let me chime chime in there as well. So from the nanotechnology side, what we're seeing, you know, broadly across the, the entire field um, is that many nanosensor transducers can get down now routinely to, to, to the single molecule level. So um, there are devices now on the market that will, you know, serially sequence DNA, you know, through a single nanopore. There are a, a, a fluorescent quantum dot or a fluorescent car carbon nanotube, you know, on a microscope stand, you'll see single fluctuations. So I think from a detection limit standpoint, of course, it depends on the experimental uh, context, but you can reach you know, down to single molecules, single copy number, single uh, detection. I think the field needs to focus more on molecular recognition because in the human health sciences, um, there's a synergy. We benefit from the antibodies and aptamers that are associated with, with human health and biological pharmaceuticals. And, and we don't really have those for this new ab application space. So in my lab, there's a portion of my lab where we're, 
we're really focused on on new molecular right recognition for these other, I would say, non non human health uh, problems. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. I'd like to add that the uh, I agree that the, the sensitivities that we get on, on instruments now is incredible. The, the real challenge is how do we, if we can detect a single CFU in 25 grams, uh, how do we get that single CFU out of that 25 grams and onto that sensor? So that's really the, the missing link and the bottleneck that uh, is not being addressed as much is, is really, we, we can detect bacteria fairly readily, but we have to get it to the place where we can detect it. And that's where there's a huge opportunity. Yeah. And Very nice that's display. probably, can, may, may I respond yes, to that too? Mm -hmm. That's why I started with looking at from the systems perspective and my presentation is that we develop magnetic nanoparticles that are glycan coated, that are room temperature, uh, very stable, we have magnetic nanoparticles that stay up to like three, four years, and they are still very effective in extracting the bacteria from the complex samples, from the complex matrix, because that is the bottleneck, as Sam mentioned. There are a lot, I mean, as far as detection, there's plenty, and the, my previous speakers are really good at this one but it's the ex extraction of the uh, target from the sample matrix. And that's where our magnetic nanoparticles, we have demonstrated that we can extract them. We can create a concentration factor much higher. So basically we, we enrich the sample before we give it to the, the other speakers for them to detect. So that's where we come in, in the magnetic nanoparticles. Very good. Uh, and I think uh, as Sam said, this is, uh, and the area of, of greater challenges uh, and uh, uh, it calls for uh, novel ideas and uh, uh, eventually you certainly propose an, uh, an effective approach, but uh, uh, maybe that uh, this is still remain to be open field and maybe that it can be benefited from some out of the box thinking and uh, we're yet to see. So it's very exciting. But Vanjie, the second question you respond, I think is also general uh, interest uh, to the audience about the cost of technology. We recognize that food and agriculture provides this unique challenge on the cost end of technology. One of the things that you may link to the personal uh, disposal income on the food and uh, only the average, we spend 13% of our disposable income on food or less. And uh, we're not willing to spend uh, more money and to make the food more expensive. So the challenge is to us uh, as technology development, uh, how do you address the cost issue and the lower down of the cost? So that is a very good question because as you mentioned, agriculture is very cost sensitive. So based on my, my interaction with the food producers, both in the animal industry, as well as the supply chain, they're talking about sense. So if you can, if you go beyond the sense level, it is very hard to implement already in the field, in the, in the agriculture. So we really have to hit the sense level. So we, that is where we strive. And by using cell phone, we already remove the cost of the instrumentation. And that is our strategy. We use cell phone and we try to maximize the power of cell phones, the, uh, the, the computational power of artificial intelligence, machine learning, but put it into the cell phone because now everybody has a cell phone. We remove the cost of instrumentation from our system. Yeah. So now we're just introducing now the, the science of nanomaterials, nanoparticles. And the interesting part that we have discovered in the lab if you have a sample, regardless water, especially water is very easy. If you have extracted that, it forms a mat on the tube. So just by looking at it, you know that the sample has high bacterial load compared to the sample that has low bacterial load. And through black pixel count, I mean, uh, coding, I mean, image processing, it is directly proportional. So the idea is, is that a way of saying, do I really need to know whether I have salmonella, listeria, E. coli? Yes, but on the other hand, the, the producer from my, our interaction with them, we just want to know whether first we have an infection. If we have an infection, we're good to go. Whether it's salmonella, listeria, now we have to put in our control strategies. And that's what they're saying. They, they want to know the details, but Overall, in their management strategy, just one big picture thing. 
And so that is what we would like to deliver to them. Just very quickly, do you have infection or not? And that they like that concept. Very good, very good. Um, that the, there are a number of questions uh, that uh, on the Q and A, as you can see, and a uh, question from a uh, uh, common government of Iowa State University and then Dr. Norm Scott of Cornell University, uh, somewhat relate, uh, and they want to see the stage of these uh, sensor technology uh, in terms of commercialization. How close do you see them? Uh, where, uh, when do you see that actually be implemented uh, in the field? Uh, and uh, I wanted to follow up with a, uh, a question that, uh, that uh, I'm very interested to know is that there are actually two possible questions. One, what do each one of you see the bottlenecks of your technology, the translation from benchtop to commercialization? And number two, what NNI agency or public private partnership can do to assist to accelerate that, uh, that process? So uh, open to all the panelists on that. I can, I can explain uh, because we are working right now with a, a company that is helping, uh, guiding us in translating our research to real practical uh, application in their, in their field, which is food safety. We have also uh, been working with collaborators from India, Nepal, Peru, and now we're starting to work with UK and the Philippines in translating this into a clinical samples, clinical as far well as food applications and plant applications. So we are in the stage of really putting them in the field. So our first strategy is just, we develop a procedure and then send them the materials and then they execute it in the field and see how it looks. So far, we are very excited about the results. Yeah. Others? Bottleneck to commercialization? What can I can do to uh, help you accelerate uh, that pace? I'll add um, one of the things, I think that there's a role for USDA and for, and for many stakeholder um, organizations to, uh, to, to, bring, to bring together uh, partners, sort of events like like the, the, uh, this one. Uh, the 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 more I learn, you know, and I'm 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 not an expert, but there there are there are, are a broad range of tools that are desperately needed, um, and they and they vary from crop to um, to, to to crop or a particular co context. I think the 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 urban farming community needs needs a certain set of tools, and then there are other tools for for large open field agriculture. And I think um. I think it's a huge task, and so br bringing um, bringing people that are ma making tools and bringing uh, connecting them to those that, that that have problems. I think that's the. I know it's it seems like an ob obvious answer, but I see that as the the, the main bottleneck. I, I could chime in too. Oh sure, well. yes, Jonathan. Yeah, so so we've been lucky enough to have you know some some industry funding to try to bring this research to commercialization. So our our fertilizer iron sensing, we're working with a company that, you know, has actually probes and technology where we can place our sensors into to make field assessments so we can see, you know, improve its longevity and really engineer it for, for use in the farm field. Um, and then in terms of, of our salmonella sensing, we do have a startup now that has some SBR grant money to look in pathogen sensing. And that's really been interesting uh, to, to look into that as, as we do these interviews with companies, we find out that some companies really don't wanna know if pathogens are in their processing line because they'll be liable for it. So, so they've asked us to look at other biomarkers that may not be the pathogens themselves, but may help, under, help them know, you know that their, their system may be dirty, so to speak, so that they can mitigate that liability. So it's, it's really having those conversations with industry is, is so important as, as we do this, this, this new science so we can tailor it for, for their needs. One thing that I really like too, that the, the National Science Foundation has started a partnerships for innovation. That's kind of a of, of grant money that kind of 
you know, transitions research out of the lab, but maybe is not quite ready for an SBIR grant or a small business grant. And it kind of helps you get to start thinking about how to commercialize it. And it'd be neat if, if USDA had it's something similar to there's that kind of gap between fundamental research and a full blown startup company that I think we still need to fill in terms of, of funding. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I agree that, and we've worked with companies uh, a bit now too. But the that gap is really the, the issue, and also uh, um, really getting faculty to have the mindset of, say, doing a startup or working with a company, having more of an entrepreneurial spirit versus, of course, just uh, having a separate full time job. Yeah. Good. Uh, let me ask uh, one more question from my audience. And um, Carla Grieger from uh, uh, NC State University asked a question about the sustainability, which you reflect in all your talk and uh, uh, this great uh, uh, recognition of the importance of sustainability. But if I may paraphrase, so the real question is that how will you know that you are truly developing a sustainable nano-based solution? What metrics will you use to measure this? So I think the question is, it's the sustainability of the system, the food system, or sustainability of the nanotechnology, nanomaterials. Where, where, where is that question? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, this is a big question. Maybe we need a little bit more time to think and contemplate. But I have another question, and this may be the, the last question we have uh, in this time frame that, uh, that we have. Uh, we have additional questions in the Q and A, uh, and um, we'll welcome panelists to, to address them individually. Or we'll pass these questions in and then to the panelists after meeting and then gather the inputs in, and we'll give a feedback back to uh, those individuals. Uh, the final question I want to ask is that: Do you see any hurdles in terms of a public perception and or regulatory hurdles? that in the technology development work that you're doing, you know, nanotechnology for agriculture and food. Anyone care comments on these two perspectives? Yes, so I think the hurdle for the nanomaterials would be if it is incorporated into the food system or it gets into the water system where now the materials could potentially be interacting with the person. So that is a concern because people are risk averse, naturally. But if there is a mechanism where, or uh, your, your application would not have any interaction with people directly or indirectly, especially directly, I think the, the concern would be less. Now, this is very interesting because there are cultural or, or regional perspectives we did a little bit of a small survey between uh, what, what the perception of nanomaterials or nanotechnology in the US and in Europe. And Europe is very much like risk averse, kind of like anything with nanotechnology, nanomaterials, things like that, they have a very different perspective. Whereas in the US, people were more tolerant, like, as long as it serves me well, it's fine, kind of perspective. So it all depends where you are in the, in the continent, in the, US, in the global continent. Maybe let me narrow that a little bit, just focus on the regulatory um, hurdles. In terms of a nano technology enabled sensor uh, technologies for agricultural for food safety application, are you aware or do you sense any regulatory hurdles in your technology development and deployment? Yes, because if there is nano materials like nanoparticles, in our case, ma na magnetic nanoparticles, when we send it to uh, our collaborators, I have to fill up a form and signify that it will not harm the environment it will not harm people. And so I have to do that every time I send the materials out. Safety of nanomaterials. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I should also mention in cases such as ours where we're doing a lot of uh, genetic engineering, of course, that's something that uh, also needs to be done fairly responsibly. And we need to make sure that everything uh, uh, stays uh, the way it is because nature obviously is ever evolving. So uh, we certainly do a lot of uh, long-term testing on that because, uh, again, phages could also lose whatever you put in them that could kick, kick out a gene. So uh, that, that's long-term stability uh, challenges that we also look at. Well, we have one minute left and uh, for uh, all the panelists uh, and I'd like to offer the opportunity uh, to have a final words from you to share with the audience. I would just like to thank Stacy and the NNI program and Hangda for inviting us to this wonderful panel. It's really an honor for me to be here. And I'm so excited to be able to share whatever I could share with you about the uh, progress of nanotechnology and how it can, it can move to be visible and, uh, and successful. All right. Uh, I would like to share that. I would like yes. to second that. <laughs> thank you. Very good. Yes, thank you to the panelists and everybody who helped put this together. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. This is such an exciting space to work into. It, you know, we have so many sensors in the biomedical field. It's great now that we're transitioning to food and agricultural um, applications as well. Well, um, just uh, I well, I will certainly uh, echo your comments. I want to uh, thank uh, Jocelyn, uh, Kalen, and uh, Christian Royal, and the, the NNCO staff. We thank uh, Stacy uh, Stanridge, uh, the NNCO Associated Director for the leadership uh, through the nanotechnology signature initiative uh, on the census. Uh, a lot of good works being uh, promoted and being organized by them. And certainly great effort for putting this uh, uh, webinar together. And mm -hmm. all of the panelists for your excellent presentation. Uh, you certainly got the attention of our audience. And uh, finally, I want to thank all the audience uh, for uh, spending this an hour and a half with us. And uh, sorry, we couldn't get to all your questions, but uh, we will pack these question, questions up, uh, send it to the panelists and uh, seek uh, their feedback on that. And, and so uh, with that, and our time's up, uh, and uh, thank you all again. And um, by now, and look up uh, the nano.gov website for additional um, public webinars that you may be interested. Thank you all.